Hello, my name is Ashley, and I am re-recording this on behalf of our Monday night Bible study group. In the background here, I have my assistant, Brutus. He will try to stay awake for this, but I can't promise anything. He generally tends to doze off, but he likes to join us every Monday from 6 to 7. And as you may have gathered on YouTube, we are going through the seven churches of Revelation. Unfortunately, there was a lot of internet issues tonight, so we did lose our recording on the Church of Philadelphia. There's a lot of great interaction and insights. So tonight, I'm just going to give a much shortened version, and we're just going to go through what is the Church of Philadelphia and why does it matter to us today as Christians? So just be a minute while I pull up a few slides to help facilitate this review. Um, feel free to listen, or if you'd like to grab your Bibles and follow along, that's even better because then you can fact check everything I say because you don't necessarily want to take my word for it. So to start with, the Church of Philadelphia is the sixth church out of the seven churches of Revelation. And this is a very exotic church because it's built on top of a mountain and there's only a few ruins that are left. Earthquakes have devastated that part of Turkey for thousands of years. And there's a modern city that is built right on top of the ruins. So if you go there today, there's only a few parts of the city where you can see the ruins of ancient Philadelphia. And just a quick reminder that this is the sixth out of seven churches. And each one of these churches was a literal church. God literally had a message that pertained to them. But it also refers to seven periods of church history, the ups, and the down. So they're a dual prophecy. It refers to a specific church, but it also refers to a certain church in time, a certain era. And now we are getting closer to the modern day. This is going to be referring to what was going on in the church in about the 1830s, the 1840s. So to give a quick summary, the first church is Ephesus, and they were doctrinally strong. They knew what was right. They were willing to stand up against it, but they didn't really love others, and ultimately, they didn't love God. So Jesus encouraged them to remember that first love, to revitalize it, to come back to him. And thankfully, many of them did. And once they did that, they really became a danger because they started becoming persecuted all across the nation. During the time of Smyrna, the age of martyrdom, thousands of Christians were wiped off. Many of them were thrown into gladiatorial arenas. We know that Nero and other emperors, they would put them inside their torches and they would actually burn them for light. Hebrews 11 talks about how some of them were sewn inside animal skins. Many of them were condemned to the catacombs underneath Rome and even possibly Athens, where they had to live out the rest of their days without any light. And if you go there today, you can actually see many of their gravestones. But during this time of martyrdom, Christianity actually became more popular. Um, people had to invest because they knew it was their life. So they were more determined, they were more committed. And in the words of Tertullian, you know, the blood of the martyrs was like the seed of the church. It was growing, it was spreading like wildfire. So then the devil changes his tactics. And the great controversy Ellen White tells us that when the church was being persecuted, it was weeding out the weeds. There was only true grain. There was only doctrinally pure people left in the church. So the devil switches up his tactics and he starts getting them to compromise. So during the age of Pergamos, this is in the early Middle Ages, um, the church starts trying to be cool. Uh, they start listening to the same music as everyone else. They just change the lyrics so that it's honoring Christian things. They start celebrating the same holidays, but they just change the name. So instead of celebrating Halloween, they're celebrating All Saints Day. Or instead of celebrating like the winter solstice, they now celebrate Christmas. Instead of praying to like Apollos and Zeus and Athena, they're now praying to Peter, Paul, Mary, all these other saints. So it was during this time during Pergamos, Jesus has a lot to say to them because they're trying too hard to be like the world around them. So then the devil doesn't really have to persecute them because they're persecuting themselves. Um, they're taking away their own salvation by deciding to be just like the world around them. And it got so bad that during the time of Theatira, this is known as the medieval ages or the dark ages, over 50 million Christians were actually killed by the papal church. So the persecuted church became the persecuting church and they started killing their own people. And if you go to the book of Revelation, Jesus has a lot of verses and a lot of things to say to the church of Theatira. But thankfully, in 1517, Martin Luther was raised up. And he actually opened the world's eyes to the fact that the Bible needs to be read in its own language. People need to pray in their own language. 
Jesus is the head of the church, not the Pope, and people are responsible to Jesus, not to the organized church. And as a result, a lot of denominations popped up, like the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, the Baptist Church. You've got Anabaptists, Methodists. Um, sorry, I just said that one. You've got Mennonites as well. And this was an age of relative freedom where you could still be persecuted. But a lot of people, especially in a lot of parts of the world, such as America, you actually got a choice of what religion you wanted to follow. But instead of appreciating this, Jesus referred to them as spiritually dead. Because once people got this freedom, they were content with what they had. They didn't push forward anymore. Uh, they didn't really care to progress in new light. They just accepted what their forefathers taught them. So in the church of Sardis, this time period represented, Jesus reminds them to like, wake up. You're spiritually dead. You're not progressing in light. And that's where we're at tonight. At the end of the Reformation, something called the awakening happened, where Christians once again were awakened to the beauty of salvation and the fact that Jesus is coming soon. So tonight, for a few minutes, we're going to delve right into Philadelphia. It's about the 1830s, about the 1840s, and what this has to teach us about our church today. So just a timeline on the bottom, just a few notes. It says, gradual transition from one period to another is very gradual and it can differ between people. It doesn't change the message, but you'll see some of these dates. There might be a few differences between different groups, but at the end of the day, we can all agree this refers to 2,000 years of history, the ups and the downs of the Christian church. So now we're at the sixth church of Philadelphia, which you can see by these beautiful ruins here. As mentioned earlier, there's not too many ruins left. They're all covered by modern day structures. But if you go there today, this is one of the exhibits that you would notice. And Philadelphia, you can tell from the root is philia means love. So Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. When the Quakers founded Pennsylvania under William Penn, one of their major cities was Philadelphia. What was unique about that city was there was no fences or walls. So Indians and colonists would actually walk the streets freely. And that was so unusual in early America. And part of this was because it was based on biblical concepts that one should love each other as themselves. So the word Philadelphia actually goes all the way back to the ancient world to a man who loved his brothers so much that people actually called him Philadelphia. And the city of Philadelphia, Turkey is actually named after him. It was built on top of a mountain, and in that part of Turkey, there's a lot of earthquakes. So oftentimes, earthquakes would ravage the city of Philadelphia, and it would have to be rebuilt. But not everyone wanted to move, because a lot of people, their family history, their heritage was there. Um, they were invested in the economy. Their livelihood was there. So sometimes when there would be tremors, they would exit the city, and then they would come back when it stopped. Or even if their house was devastated, they would live in a little hut until they could build it up again, and then they would re-enter their new home. So when Jesus promised the Christians of Philadelphia that they would have a pillar in the temple of my God and go out no more, he's referencing their ancient city because it was always in ruins. It was always being devastated. People were always going in and they were coming out. So he was giving them a promise of permanency. Also, because it's in a very valuable part of the world where there is always a power grab, it was always exchanging hands between the Greeks, the Romans, the Ottoman Turks, and other groups of people. So when Jesus said that they would go out no more and he would give them a new name, he's once again promising them a sense of permanency. No longer would they be bounced around. No longer would they be in and out. Those that were faithful to him would have a permanent home, a pillar in the temple of my God. They wouldn't go out anymore, and then they would have God's name and Jesus's name written upon them. So to the Christians of Philadelphia, this was particularly meaningful. If you want to look up some fun videos, just type in the Church of Philadelphia on YouTube. There's a lot of five-minute videos. There's some 30-minute documentaries. My best suggestions for you, which I personally like, is a series from Our Daily Bread. It's really great, and it's filmed on location. Another five-minute series is from Lineage Journey, and another five-minute series is from Salisbury Bible Fellowship. Out of all the videos I've perused, those are the top three, the top three channels that I really like. So if the history interests you, go back, check those out a little bit more. But as we go throughout the message to the Christians of Philadelphia, we can see Jesus doesn't have anything bad to say to them. 
And if you could see from the background right now, my supervisor is wide awake here, making sure we get through this. So he's just a fun little guy to look at here. Hi, Brutus. So to get back to the Bible text, we can see that Jesus doesn't have anything bad to say to them at all. In fact, he says, you're faithful. You've held fast my name. You know, when other people are ridiculing you, you were steadfast. Like, I don't have anything bad to say about you. And then he talks about a door that is opened. It can never be shut. And if you look up these other Bible verses on the screen, you're going to see that the context here is the door of salvation, the door of opportunity. Jesus opens this door and it's open to anyone. Like if you want to, you can walk through this door of salvation. If you could get your hands on an old fashioned SDA Bible commentary, it's a great resource to have because if there's a verse you don't really understand, you could open it up and you could see what have Adventist scholars throughout the ages said about this particular verse. And this is what they have to say about the door that's referenced in verse 7. It says, The door of unlimited opportunity for personal victory in the struggle for sin and for bearing witness to the saving truth of the gospel. So this is a door of opportunity. Jesus is opening it up and you have the opportunity to be saved. But it also refers to the door in heaven, because as we're going to learn about in a few slides, 1844, something really important happened, and Jesus entered from the holy place to the most holy place. So that door was opened. So a lot of times in scripture, you could have a dual prophecy or a dual application where it's one verse, but it applies to two different incidents. So in this verse here, it refers to the door of salvation because Jesus opens it and nobody can shut it. But it also refers to the door of the most heavenly place that Jesus entered in in 1844. And that prophecy comes from Daniel 8 and Daniel chapter 9. And he also gives another promise. And he says, to those that are faithful, I will keep you from the hour of temptation. And we know from Matthew 24 and other scriptures, particularly in Isaiah, that there is a time of trial coming upon this world that we cannot even imagine. We know that in these last days, there's going to be something called the time of trouble, where nation will rise against nation, pestilences, famines will rise up. People are going to turn in their own family members. Governments are going to conspire against them and try to wipe them out. All these constitutional freedoms that we know about, according to Revelation 13, they're going to be taken away. And not only is there this time of trouble, but there's something called the time of Jacob's trouble. According to Genesis, Jacob wrestled all night with a foreign man. He didn't realize that this man was Jesus. And Ellen White tells us in Patriarchs and Prophets that as he was wrestling, it wasn't the physical fight that was stressing him out. It was actually the fact that he didn't know if his sins were forgiven. He was appalled that he had deceived his father, Isaac, and his brother, Esau. He felt that God couldn't forgive him, but he claimed the promises of God. He repeated God's promises to Jesus, even though he didn't know he was fighting Jesus. And in the end, Jesus rewarded him, and he actually gave him a new name, Israel, which symbolized his victory. No longer was his name Jacob, which means deceiver. So this time of Jacob's trouble that Ellen White talks a lot about in the great controversy and last day events is a time when Christians, they're not going to feel like their sins are forgiven. They're going to feel like they don't deserve heaven, that Jesus has abandoned them, but they're going to claim his promises and they're going to repeat these promises to him. Even though they don't feel like they're forgiven, they don't feel like these promises apply to them. They're going to claim them because they know that's what scripture says to do. And as a result, they're going to be spared from the hour of temptation. Jesus will come. It says in Daniel chapter 12, Michael will rise up, which we know is another name for Jesus. He will deliver his people. And then according to Revelation 21, they will be reunited with God and Jesus, and they will wipe all tears from their eyes. So that's in the future, probably in the near future, not too distant future. But a lot of us have trials in our life right now. And we may have trials that are out of our control. But there's also trials probably that we brought upon ourselves. I know when I look at my life, most of the trials I went through was because I brought them upon myself. And if you go back to the hymn book, to this hymn that's called Come Ye Sinner, Poor and Needy, it takes place in the 1700s, which was the golden age of hymn writing. It was also the golden age of piracy, but thankfully there was a lot of Christians still around. So those Christians focused their efforts on writing these beautiful hymns. And there was a man who struggled with secret sin. 
We don't know what that sin was, but he grew up in the 1700s in London. And during that time, the big sins for men were houses of prostitution, gambling, opium, and alcohol. So we can just surmise possibly or infer that he probably struggled in one of these areas. And no matter what he did, he couldn't break himself from this sin. He would have these moments of conviction and come to Christ, but then he would fall right back into the sin. And it was back and forth, back and forth. And it was actually a New Year's evening that he was wandering the streets of London and he heard a sermon being preached on Revelation 3.10 about how if we are faithful, we will be kept from the hour of temptation. And that's when the light bulb went off and he realized, I'm trying to keep myself from temptation. It must be Jesus that keeps me from temptation. And from then on out, he didn't struggle with the sin anymore because he realized he needed to throw himself at the feet of Jesus. He could not get rid of this temptation himself, but he could rely on Jesus and Jesus helped him make him through it. And as a result, he actually wrote this hymn called Come Ye Sinner, Poor and Needy. A lot of people at the Bible study brought up a fact that um, it's in the hymn book and Michael Card actually sings a beautiful rendition of it. But I'm just going to read the lyrics to you and just imagine sins that you have struggled with, sins that are very difficult to get rid of. This is a perfect song to offer you encouragement, to offer you hope, and to remind yourself to throw yourself at the feet of Jesus. So this is what it starts with the first stanza. Come ye sinners, poor and needy, weak and wounded, sick and sore. Jesus ready stands to save you, full of pity, love, and power. Come ye thirsty, come and welcome, God's free bounty glorify. True belief and true repentance, every grace that brings you nigh. Let us not conscience make you longer, linger, nor a fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. Come ye weary, heavy laden, lost and ruined by the fall. If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Then the best stanza. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will save me from my sin. By the riches of his merit, there is joy and life in him. So the author of this hymn just reminds us, arise and go to Jesus. He's the one that will keep you from the hour of temptation. During these hard days that are going to be coming upon us, it's not our strength that's going to get us through it. It's the merits that Jesus places around us, that surrounds us with, that will get us through this time. So Revelation 3.10 is a beautiful verse to memorize, to remind ourselves that Jesus will keep the faithful from the hour of temptation, from the time of Jacob's trouble that will be coming upon the world. He also promises them another beautiful promise in verse 12. And it's actually a threefold promise. I don't know about you, but it's easy to hate your character because you're like, I'm so selfish. I'm so sinful. Everything I do has a selfish motive attached to it. I can't get rid of this. I can't get rid of this. I fall back into this. Well, Jesus knows our faulty condition and he has promised to write his law and his name on our heart. You know, in Isaiah, excuse me, in Ezekiel, it says, a new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. You know, in other parts like Hebrews, it says, I will write my name upon them. I will write my law upon their heart. So in verse 12 of Revelation 3, God says three times that he will permanently write himself or impress himself upon us. The first reference says that he will give us a pillar in the temple of God. Well, in the ancient city of Philadelphia, earthquakes are always breaking down things. Also, if you were a pagan priest and you served a lifetime to the worship of some god like Zeus or Athena, you would actually get a permanent pillar in their temple with your name inscribed on it. So Jesus said, better yet, I am going to give you a pillar in the temple of God. No longer will you be displaced. No longer will you go in and out of the city. No longer will you be ravaged by earthquakes. I will give you a permanent pillar. Secondly, in this verse, he says, I will give you the name of God in the New Jerusalem. I will write it upon you. So Jeff brought up a good point. In this verse, it says that God will be given a new name. What's that new name? He brought up several biblical points that pointed to maybe this name might be Almighty. I know that we in the study, we're going to go back. We're going to study it even more because we want to know what new name is God talking about? And then the third point is that Jesus's name will be written upon us. 
And there's two other verses in Revelation that talk about a new name. In Revelation 2, verse 17, God's talking to the Christians at the church of Pergamos. And he's telling them, he said, to he that overcometh, why I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. So you're going to have this special name that Jesus gives you, and it's going to be between you and Jesus. No one else is going to know it. And a very famous book in the Adventist church is by Stephen Haskell. He was a founding father. He wrote The Study of the Seer of Patmos. And this is what he had to say about this new name that nobody knows except you and Jesus. He says, Others may pronounce its name, but its significance is a secret between Christ and the individual. The one who receives it has been guilty of idolatry and fornication, and none other save his Lord can know the soul experience which bought the new name. So nobody knows about this name except you and Jesus. And nobody knows the sins that Jesus rescued you from. I know in my life certain sins he's rescued me from. Thankfully, other people don't need to know that. So this new name that I have is between me and Jesus. So every time he calls me by that name, I'm just going to be reminded of the sins that he rescued me from. A second book here is Hebrews by M.L. Andreessen. And to just give you some historical facts about him, M.L. Andreessen was an amazing Adventist theologian. theologian. Um, he formulated the theory Last Generation Theology. Ellen White backs this up on page 69 of Christ Object Lessons. It's basically saying when God's character is perfectly reproduced in his people, then Jesus will come. Now, we're not going to do that on our own. It's going to be Christ's righteousness in us that does that. But this is a highly controversial area. So I encourage you to get some of his books. Um, he expounds on it a lot more. Um, Ellen White writes a lot about it. Like I said, page 69 in Christ Object Lessons. But he was an amazing man. He even carried Ellen White's casket when she died in 1915. However, in the 1950s, a lot of people were saying that the Adventist church was a cult. And they were encouraging people to distance themselves from them. So some of the leaders of the Adventist church basically wrote this book called Questions on Doctrine. And they tried to ingratiate themselves with the rest of Protestantism and show that they're just like everyone else. So some of these key tenets, they kind of dumbed them down a little bit to make us more likable to the Christian world. And this was a highly polarizing issue. You had the more um, biblically sound in the church saying, this is wrong. We shouldn't be doing this. We should be okay with being a peculiar people. We need to maintain what our doctrine is. And other people saying, oh, no, 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 this is important. People need to know we're not a cult. And there's actually a pretty big divide within the church. Well, Emma Landreason was speaking out to a lot of leaders, and his pastoral credentials were actually revoked. Uh, they said, you are no longer a pastor of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he ended up dying shortly thereafter, which is pretty sad. Now, after the fact, after he died, um, they actually reinstated his credentials. But at that point, it's a little too late. He's dead. He won't know he was vindicated until Jesus returns and he's resurrected. But nowadays, um, he's been reinstated. A lot of people like to read his books. He wrote one called The Sanctuary Service. He wrote one called Hebrews. Um, he wrote another one on the Sabbath. No matter how much they are online, $20, $40, I encourage you to buy them. They are going to help expand upon this doctrine in a way that you never heard of before. I was actually excited to come home from school and read the book of Leviticus because he explained it so beautifully and so powerfully, and it finally made sense to me. So in his book on Hebrews, he talks about the special relationship that we have with God. And he says, we are now closely united with God in a fellowship that is even closer than that which the angels know. They have not known the surpassing joy of being lifted from the mire of sin into the kingdom of God. They have never heard the sweet news of sin forgiven. So according to Psalms 8, we're created a little bit lower than the angels, but we have a special relationship with God that even the angels don't have because they have never heard the news of sins forgiven. So they don't have that gratitude for God as we do. So when we have a new name and a new relationship with God, it truly is beautiful because it's something that no one else in the entire universe has. And as we concluded this part of our study, we just wanted to apply it to more modern times because everything the Christians in Philadelphia were going through, they were going through difficult times, through ridicule, through trial, through tribulation. 
Jesus didn't have anything bad to say to them. In fact, he commended them for their good works and he gave them several promises. And this is going to apply to a group of believers in the 1830s and the 1840s here in America and in other parts of the world. So this is the sixth period in Christian history. We know that the previous period was Sardis. And at the end of the Reformation, people were spiritually dead. If you check this out in Revelation chapter 3, Jesus doesn't have anything good to say to them because they're just dead. Like, they're just like everyone else around them. They're content in their state. They're not progressing in light or in knowledge. But God didn't give up on them. During this time, he actually sent a lot of radical signs and wonders. Revelation predicted a lot of these. In 1755, there was a great Lisbon earthquake that impacted a lot of the world. In 1780, there was a dark day where it was so dark you couldn't even see your hand in front of your face. And then the moon was blood red. In the 1833, there was stars falling from heaven. And people that studied Revelation and studied the seals, they knew that these were things that would happen right before Jesus came. And then it was during this time that a man, William Miller, in 1831, he was a world of he was a war of 1812 veteran. He was a deist. But he saw that God had intervened in the Battle of Plattsburgh, and there was no explanation for it because he was a deist who didn't believe that God was interested. And he started studying his Bible, and he gave his heart to God, or to Christ, I should say, both technically. And then he started pouring over the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and he came to the conclusion, after much study, that Jesus was coming in about the year 1843-1844. And at first he was real nervous. But he kept being impressed to share this message. And before you know it, in just a few years, there was 100,000 Adventists who were preaching that Jesus was coming soon. This wasn't just in America. People in Africa, in Asia, in North and South America were preaching this. There was even a Jesuit priest in South America that was preaching that Jesus was coming in 1844. So this was a message that truly was all throughout the world. But as we know, Jesus did not come in 1844. But that doesn't change the date. The event didn't happen, but people had misinterpreted that Bible verse. But thankfully, something very radical and very life-changing actually did happen on 1844. And we're going to talk about that at a later study. There'll be other resources, but just keep that in your mind. 1844 is a very, very significant date. In this time, the Christians, the Christians of Philadelphia who loved each other, they thought Jesus was coming, so they sold everything, their farms, their clothes, their stores, anything that was between them and someone else, they righted their wrongs. They wanted to be at peace and loving everyone. And then every day and every night, they would examine themselves. Am I right with Jesus? He's coming and I want to be ready. And that's characteristic of what we should be like right now, because they thought Jesus would come in 1844. And Ellen White says at that time, nobody went to bed until you made sure that you were right with God. In fact, when she looks back on this experience, and she was a teenager at that time, she says it was one of the most beautiful experiences of her life. And this is from some of her recollections in Review and Herald from 1885. She was an older woman when she wrote this, but she always looked upon those years with fondness, and she wished that more of us would have that type of experience. This is what she said. Someone would commence to pray or sing, and a number would begin to gather in. There was labor for some soul yet in the dark, and earnest pleading went up to God in his behalf till he would break down and seek God for himself. When victory came, there was great rejoicing. There was a more thorough and heartfelt confession of sin than we usually see in these days. These meetings went on in many places, and many souls were converted in that manner. One could go out in the grave in the early excuse me, one could go out in the grove in the early morning, and many persons could be seen kneeling there and there, pleading earnestly for God's blessing. The voice of prayer could be heard in many directions. There was an entire absence of levity in the visiting spirit. Earnestness, devotion, and love for the coming of Christ were everywhere present. Oh, that more of this was now present. So these Christians of Philadelphia were so in love with Jesus. They were so in love with each other that they just wanted to make sure they were at peace and they were right with God. So if you check out some of the Bible verses of Daniel 7 verse 10 and Revelation 14, 6 and 7, this is the end point for the 2,300 day year prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14. And we're going to have some different references, some different resources if you want to check this out more. 
But for those of you that have been in the church for a while, we know, according to Bible prophecy, many other Christians believe this as well, one day equals one year. And in Daniel, it talks about there's going to be 2,300 years where the sanctuary truth will be cast down. But then something radical is going to happen at this end of this prophecy. So it started in 457 BC, according to a lot of historical documents, and it ended in 1844. And earlier in this passage, Jesus talked about an open door. And we know that there's a door between the holy place and the most holy place. So just like once a year, the priest, according to Leviticus, would go into the most holy place. Everything that was done on this earth is replicated in heaven, according to the book of Hebrews. So because it's replicated, there's one time where Jesus is actually going to enter into the most holy place through this open door. And according to Bible prophecy, that was in the year 1844. For the sake of time, I'm not going to explain it any further, but I encourage you to go to YouTube and check out Sapphire Throne Media. It's called Sapphire Throne Media. They have the best prophecy videos I've ever watched. They're only five minutes. And they explain all these amazing prophecies that can sometimes be overwhelming. They explain it with a lot of visuals and graphics in less than five minutes. So go to Sapphire Throne Media and type in 2000. 300 years and they're going to bring you to this video and they're going to talk about what exactly happened in 1844. And during this time Ellen White sheds a little bit more light as to what was going on. This is what she says. The 144,000 were all sealed and perfectly united. On their foreheads was written God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star containing Jesus's new name. If you go back to Revelation chapter 3, verse 12, there are three promises that have to do with God, New Jerusalem, and a glorious star concerning Jesus' name. At our happy holy state, the wicked were enraged. They would rush violently up to lay hands on us to thrust us into prison. When we would stretch forth the hand in the name of the Lord, and they would fall helpless to the ground. So remember, in this message, the Church of Philadelphia, it talks about people falling down at their feet. Then it was that the synagogue of Satan, which is referenced in this church of Philadelphia, the synagogue of Satan would know that God loved us who could wash one another's feet and salute the brethren with a holy kiss. And they, the synagogue of Satan, worshipped at our feet. So these are the 144,000 that are going to be translated. Now, other people will be saved, but when Jesus comes, 144,000 will be translated without seeing death. Now, it's not a bad thing to die prior to this. Methuselah died in the year of the flood. He was way too old to get on the ark. A lot of righteous people are laid to sleep prior to Noah getting on the boat. And Ellen White tells us in many writings, older people and young children will be laid to sleep right before Jesus comes. And a lot of people maybe who can't make it through for whatever reason, Jesus will mercifully lay to sleep. But there's going to be a group of people that are going to be translated without seeing death. And if we look at their characteristics in the book of Revelation and also in Ellen White's early writings, all of the characteristics fit what Jesus said to the church of Philadelphia. So if there's one church you really want to model, I would say the church of Smyrna and the church of Philadelphia. Those are the only two churches Jesus doesn't have anything bad to say. And this is what Ellen White has to say. Now, just as sure as the Philadelphian church is the true church of the last days, just so sure the 144,000 are sealed just before the coming of the Lord. So you're probably familiar with the Church of Laodicea. That's the last church that we're going to study next week. That's the state that we in general are in. We're lukewarm. We're not too hot. We're not too cold. We're content. We go to church. We might listen to a sermon on Sabbath. Maybe we listen to one during the week, but that's about it. We do our own thing. You know, we talk the talk, but we don't always walk the walk. We're very concerned with ourselves, what's easiest for us. And I'm talking about myself. So the characteristics of the Laodicean church apply to much of the church today. But Ellen White reminds us that the 144,000 are not going to be Laodiceans. They're going to be people who have the same characteristics as the Philadelphian church. So if there's any messages you should go back and read, I encourage you to go to Revelation chapter 3, 
read Jesus's message to the church of Philadelphia, because that's representative of what the Christians are going to be like at the end of time, those that will be translated in the air. So this was just a scratch on the surface. Um, basically, if you want to go back and study more, we have previous studies, you can watch them on YouTube. But just remember that Isaiah says, Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. You're not going to understand it all at once. I certainly don't. But you study, you cross-reference it, you study again, you pray for understanding. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So Jesus will give you the wisdom. There's been times where I've been pouring over questions and literally Bible verses were just dumped in my head. Verses I had never heard of before. And they were the exact verse to answer the question that I needed. So Jesus is very personally invested in your Bible study, and he will give you the wisdom and answer the questions that you have. And remember, Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. So Jesus will give you the strength. If it's boring, if it's hard to understand, if it's confusing, Jesus will give you wisdom, he'll give you clarity, and he'll give you strength. Now, if there's a few books that you'd like to get to help you out, um, I actually wrote a Bible study for all seven churches. So as a teacher, I try to make it easy to understand. So I hope that if you are interested, just email me at Ashley underscore Ingrid, I-N-G-R-I-D at yahoo.com. And I'll send you this um, Bible study curriculum. Also, if you have an old fashioned set of SDA Bible commentaries at your house, those are great. Because if there's a Bible verse you don't understand, you just flip open to that verse and they're going to give you SDA thoughts and comments on it. They're going to give you other Bible verses to reference. Uh, there might be a copy in the church library at Fort Myers, so you definitely could borrow or check that out as well. Secondly, you could go to the old-fashioned evangelists like HMS Richards, HMS Richards Jr. Um, these are great guys. They have great sermons and publications that have really helped me understand. But the all-time classic, I personally think, Ellen Weiss said everyone should read this, is Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. You can actually view it online, just look up a PDF. It's literally hundreds, if not thousands of pages, but I suggest just ordering your own copy. It's not that expensive. And prior to that, I wasn't always retaining Daniel and Revelation, but when I read his book, it was like scales fell off my eyes. And for the first time, it made total sense and I was able to retain it so that I could share it with others. So out of all the books on prophecy, I encourage you, besides the Bible, to check out Daniel and the Revelation by Uriah Smith. Also, at Amazing Facts at their Bible School, I believe that they used to, maybe they still do, they use these shorter books by Roy Allen Anderson. One is called Unfolding Daniel's Prophecy. Another one is called Unfolding the Revelation. Super easy to read. They're short. They're to the point. They have a lot of historical anecdotes and things like that. Um, I encourage you to get those as well. All of these are older publications, so probably just look them up online, or you could email me and I can send you out some links. Lastly, at the end of the day, if it comes down to YouTube resources, my top favorite one for prophecy is Sapphire Throne Ministries. You can check it out at their website here, sapphirethroneministries.com, or just go to YouTube and type in Sapphire Throne Ministries, okay? They're going to have a lot of great resources. Now, there is a Sapphire Throne Media and a Sapphire Throne Ministries. I get them confused a lot, and one of them is really new agey, and one of them is really biblically sound. So if you look them up and it looks a little weird, look up the other one, and that will be the one that gives a lot of prophecy videos about Daniel and Revelation. So in conclusion, this was intended for people that like to study a lot. Um, I hope this gets you riled up and wanting to pour over the prophecies, particularly the message to the Church of Philadelphia. Um, if you have any resources that you'd like to share with me, please do. You can email me at Ashley underscore Ingrid, I-N-G-R-I-D at yahoo.com. I hope you have an amazing evening. And if you don't mind, I'd like to close in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much that we have the freedom to talk about this, to record this. Um, I don't know why the recording didn't go through with the other people, but I praise you for the people in the study group who brought a lot of insight and who brought a lot of application to the study. I ask that you bless every single person, those that are listening. And please just dump information into their mind, you know, shed light on scripture so that they know what you truly have to say. Help us to be able to retain it so that we can share it with others. And we just once again praise you that you are coming soon. Thank you that we don't have anything to fear if we trust in you. We love you, Lord Jesus, in your precious and holy name. Amen.